I'm James Jolly and I'm thrilled to be sitting down and chatting with some of today's most inspiring artists. Welcome to this episode of Music Makers, a series in which we meet some of the most talented musicians on the planet. Players who started young are hardly unusual, but my guest today has had one of the most vertiginous climbs to the top of his profession, signing to record for Deutsche Grammophon while still only 15 years old. He's the Swedish violinist Daniel Luzakovic. An admirer from afar, I'm looking forward to finding out what has shaped this superb musician into the music maker that he is. So we've, we've landed the Medici studio in somewhere very special. We're halfway up a mountain in Switzerland, in Verbier. Uh, this is somewhere that's very special to you, I think, as a place. Yes, I think it's a special place for every musician who are here. This is my, uh, I cannot even remember, eighth, seventh time I've been here since I was 13. And this was the place which brought me kind of to the classical music world and to get to know all these great, greatest musicians of today. And thanks because of Martin Engstrom really gave the most support and help and who kind of believed in me even at that young age to come here. So it was uh, a huge honor and still is and it's each time it's like a first time because there's always so much things to do, so many great concerts and there's it's the only festival that you can meet all these great musicians at the same time and uh, go to all these concerts. It's not like you play a concert and leave. Uh, you play and then you can go to other concerts. And then you have dinners with all these musicians. You can talk about music, about life, and like people who you admire suddenly you see in real life. So we, we have an expression in English called a busman's holiday, which basically means you go on holiday, but actually when you're on holiday, you're doing exactly what you do in your normal life. And I always think that Verbier is a little bit like a busman's holiday in that you come, you make music, but at the same time, it's a completely different atmosphere from the fly in, do your concerto, fly out. You're here for, you know, days, more than, you know, more than a week or so, giving a number of concerts. And yeah. many pieces of music are, are sort of created from nothing to full performance in a matter of days. I mean, that must be quite unusual for your kind of schedule. Yes very different and also I don't sadly perform as much chamber music so I have the opportunity to perform here and uh, with really musicians that I admire and look up to like yesterday we performed with Mikhail Plitnyov who is my favorite pianist and uh, then with Misha Maisky, legendary cellist, who's one of my favorite musicians and uh, then tomorrow with Martin Frost and with uh, uh, Lucas de Barg before we did with my friend Alexander Kantarov. So there's a lot of great uh, opportunities to do chamber music here and learn from each other and uh, learn from the best. And it's really a special place to do music in a different way. Does it make you miss chamber music for the rest of the year? I mean uh, y yes, of course, uh, very much. It's just you know, don't have really the time because only like concertos or like duo recitals or solo and to have the opportunity to do chamber music in such a great long period kind of mm. in the summer is very special, especially with such legendary musicians. I mean, let's go back to the, the sort of beginning of your career, which actually in real terms isn't very long time-wise. But you, you, from what I can gather, you started playing the violin and you made your debut in an incredibly short space of time. I mean, what was it that sort of you thought, I got to play the violin? What was that sort of change, of mo that changing moment in your life? Well, it was when I first time saw the violin. I knew directly I'm going to be a violinist. And when I heard it, I, I got tears 
it just felt something strangely familiar, but it was the first time seeing it and hearing it. What was the what was the piece of music? Do you recall? It was the Bach A minor concerto, and it was in a music school in Sweden, and uh, there I had to pick an instrument out of eighteen. And there I saw the violin, and I completely fell in love with it. Like it was like some magic spell, and that's why I recorded the Bach album, my first album with the A minor concerto, because it was the first uh, experience in violin music for me. And had you, had you read, uh, could you read, read music before you took up the violin or did that happen? No, 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 like my parents are not mu musicians, but they saw that I'm musical because like I, I loved singing before and uh, in kind of in this Russian tradition, uh, they have that their kids should learn uh, music just for educational purpose. Like most of the kids, not just Russian, but in general, mm -hmm. this culture just to play the piano, just to know at least. And uh, but as I was like musical, they brought me to a music school, and uh, yeah, that's how I saw and experienced the violin for the first time. And have, is there, was there music anywhere further back in your family? I discovered uh, that my grandfather is a sculptor, a very famous one in uh, Kyrgyzstan. So I have some art in my, uh, how do you call it, blood <laughs> lifeline. And, and I mean, you, you were born in Sweden, but you, you come from you know, a, mi a mixture of uh, Belarusian and Kyrgyzstan. Um, do, you think, do you think that's sort of in your DNA? Do you, think, do you ever sort of somehow reconnect with that when you play music? I mean, when you say play the Tchaikovsky concerto, is there something that connects, do you think? For sure. I believe it's the culture in your blood and the way of life you have and the uh, ancestors and the way you feel in your soul goes through the ancestors and culture, I believe. And then the more beauty you see in life, the more you experience this, what you carry with you. And now when I was for the first time in Kyrgyzstan last month at the concert there, and I understood that. Did it feel like home? It did. First time it felt like something really special. The nature was the most beautiful nature I've ever seen. The most, uh, it was a very sacred place. It's uh, so beautiful and I just felt so connected and uh, I understood that this something from my blood, you know, because I have a lot of different, I'm on, I don't only have Kyrgyz or Belarusian, like from my father's side, my grandmother was Ukrainian, my grandfather was Belarusian and Russian. So and my, from my mom's side, it's uh, Kyrgyz and Tatar and Uzbek. So it's uh, a whole mixture of the <laughs> Soviet countries. <laughs> and um, when was it sort of in your, you know, when you'd started playing the violin and you clearly, you know, had a talent for it, when did you suddenly decide, actually, this is going to be my life rather than, you know, just something like a, a hobby that you were very, very good at? I knew directly. You knew directly? My mom didn't want me to play the violin at the beginning because nobody wants a scratchy violin at their house at the beginning. <laughs> but then again, if you, if, you, if you gave your first performance within two years, you probably got over the scratchy stage quite quickly. Yes, uh, that's, this was, uh, I was lucky to not scratch too much at the beginning. And, but I knew directly. It was something strange. I was so convinced this is my instrument and I'm going to do this. And I had zero idea about it before I saw it, the violin. It was really like a magic spell, I would say. And, and, and what, what did your mentors do in the early days? Did they kind of d sort of find out what sort of musician you were and then, you know, helped you cultivate that, helped you bring it out from, from within? I had a lot of mentors in my life uh, that I'm very fortunate and uh, today 
I have Yusuf Risin since I was 11 who made me the violinist I am today and my uh, a coach, mentor, Eduard Wolfson, who has been with me since I was 14. And we have almost been together every day. He has become really like a family. And they all are, but and my teachers. But uh, Eduard, we have been together with so many life things. And uh, he really took me out of some... Uh, bad places and bad uh, emotional states and really have helped me a lot mm -hmm. and uh, in the violin of course to strengthen my my playing and uh, focus my musicality but now I worked a lot with uh, Mikhail Pletnyov and uh, I've learned so much we have known each other now for more than a year and I've learned like what I've probably would have learned in decades. It's really incredible. Then of course, Valery Gergiev, I have performed the most with, and he has been the biggest part in my stage experience and uh, the touring experience with orchestra and uh, sound and acoustics. And this has been a huge part for me. And, and tell us about your, your instruments, because you, you're already on your second strad. I mean, most people probably wait a lifetime and you're already on number two. I mean, did, did you, the first time you played a strad, I mean, that must be an extraordinary experience because it's just something completely different to... Yes. I mean, the strad, it's not really an instrument of just like a violin. I would say it's like a really a mysterious craft. It's like... I would compare it to what Michelangelo did, what Da Vinci, what, uh, yeah, or, uh, like when you look at a sculpture of Michelangelo, it's not just a sculpture, it really connects to something else. And Strads and Del Jesus, if they are in peak condition, they are alive and they have their personality and uh, you have to experience this because it takes time. It's not an instrument that you play and it's just you are familiar directly. Okay, this is what it does, all right. Which is much easier. With the Strad or the Jesu, like you, but I've mostly performed with Stradivarius uh, my, uh, in my life and uh, you really can dig into some mysteries of sound of the instrument, of the personality, and the colors are unlimited. But if you don't really know how to focus them, it's better to play on a normal instrument than on a Strad. It will sound worse because there's this saying, uh, you play not how you want, but how she wants with the Stradivarius. And this really, and you experience and find new secrets every day in different halls in, when you practice. And uh, it really inspires you because it can bring the music to a different level. It can really bring the mysteries of the music, this uh, otherworldly qualities which these instruments can do. But this you have to really find really dig deep into that personality. I mean, one of the extraordinary things about these great instruments is it sort of, it, it connects you to a playing tradition. You know, you can almost, you can go back and see all the people who, who played your instruments. I mean, are there any incredible violinists who played the two that you've been familiar with? I've played actually with few strads in my life. So like when I was uh, uh, 14, I started with the uh, ex Viotti, uh, it was from 1712, so Viotti was a great violinist composer and uh, legendary, you know, from s uh, hundreds of years ago, so it uh, was already like, whoa, Viotti, I've been playing on this strat. And this was thanks to Eduard Wilson and Christopher Runing, who have uh, lent me these instruments and then now I'm 
uh, I played then later at X Rothschild 1713, also from Edward and Chris. And now uh, I perform with Stradivarius uh, X Renier from Louis Vuitton Foundation, uh, which was incredible, 1727. And then today I'm performing on Stradivarius uh, X Tan 1719 also from Louis Vuitton Foundation. And there's so many personalities and there are such a strong personalities. It's really like human beings, but at the top of their artistry, you know, it's, you c can't compare them. And uh, I've been lucky to experience them and to live with them, which is so important because it really evolves your musical ideas because you see there's more opportunities to have the most sensitive sound, the most soulful, almost even uh, power. But they're not famous for power. Violin is not a power instrument. I believe what makes these instruments special too is that they project in these big halls. Like Sadivaris, when they made uh, those violins, it was like for like maximum, maybe 200 people, yeah. maximum. And now still today, they project the best, but project not by loudness, by, by the pianissimos, by the most sensitive sound can carry. And this is the mystery that nobody can experience and uh, create a new thing. Like with the technology we have today, they could do exactly the same perfection, with still it's Wouldn't be nothing close. It's not alive. Then they say it's special wood back then uh, that only back then they had this special wood that made the Stradivarius. But it's, I believe it's the same uh, to say like Mozart had a magical pen. It's genius. Mm. It's, uh, there's many violin makers back then, but nobody was Stradivarius or Del Gesso. And have any of your instruments been play played by people who've recorded? I mean, are there, you know, can you hear one of your instruments being played on record by somebody famous, you know, from, I don't know, 20, 30, 50, 70 years ago? Oh, yes. I mean, there's so many g great recordings. I mean, Yasha Haif, it's any recording, but he played on a Del Gesso, strangely. This was a v also a very strange thing that he had this Stradivarius, which was is supposed to be, to be better, but he was more comfortable with the Del Gesso because he could really dig the instrument and... Uh, it was uh, for his personality. Mm, mm. And then uh, Menuhin had the most legendary Del Gesso, Lord Vilton. Then uh, if you listen to the old recordings of Chrysler, his Del Gesso, then uh, Stradivari of Milstein, you can hear the sweetness, you can hear the, this aliveness of a Strad, you know, Christian Ferraz. There's so many, but then my favorite, like if I had to pick one violin recording, uh, that I would say is like perfection. represents perfection, would be Yusuf Hasid. Of it's like twenty five minutes. Uh, he died very young, and uh, so he he wasn't able to record more. But what was interesting is that this instrument belonged to Chrysler. What he played. It was a Viom, a French violin, and not a Stradivarius, and he still made magic. Because I mean, it's one of the saddest. Uh, it's always difficult when you listen to record. The, you know, I mean, not that has he man made many recordings. There's basically a sort of like a half a CD's worth of his recordings. But I mean, apart from the, just the astounding beauty and, and kind of lyricism of his playing, you know, it's very difficult not to think of the of the sort of tragedy behind the guy's life because you know he he was he was uh, he had schizophrenia and his life just kind of you know he was locked away and it it's just it's horrifying yeah um, that then with the lobotomy he died yeah which is terrible and then there's this quote what chrysler said that uh, hyphas was considered the greatest and uh, for me he's probably the greatest what he has achieved and as an artist of a violin, probably is. But Chrysler said, they all lived at the same time, uh, that Haifetz 
is born every hundred years and has seed every two hundred years. Yeah. So are you, you, I mean, you know, the, the violinists you've been talking to are, are very much sort of, you know, the middle of the 20th century. I mean, Hassid died in, what, 1950? Yeah. And, you know, Heifetz's sort of career was the sort of centre. I mean, is that, a, is that a period of music making that attracts you? I, this is a period of violinists that attracts me mm. because of their strong personality and their strong, really, soul in their playing that you can directly like that's Heifetz or that's Christian Ferrand or that's sharing mm. because uh, those people really show that you can transcend that the violin is a uh, you're an artist of the instrument and why do you think why do you think sort of they had the great personalities and then people in successive ge generations i mean were were people less inclined do you think to take risks so the personality didn't show through probably but at the same time it can also be uh you're not able to because the knowledge they had from then the knowledge and the colleagues the experience of life is so much different and this so much, uh, it really is important for the music, for the art, that the life you live, I believe, is the sound you make. So if you had a normal, I don't know, just the being in school, uh, music, then going out and playing, you wouldn't really have anything to say. And, just and also, being in the instrument. and life was much sort of slower in many respects. So, for example, you know, if you were going to the United States to play, you would have had four days on a ship, yeah, to kind of things to unfold gradually. Whereas nowadays, you know, you hop on a plane, and ten hours later, you're you're the other side of the Atlantic. Yeah, but it's also uh, the influences. It has to be very strong influences, and not just in music in art, in literature, in, uh, in life, in uh, just everything that connects to culture. I believe all this music, art, literature, sculptures, uh, all this is not uh, like sections. It's all together. It's all one culture. And you have to evolve all this the same. And not just like, let's say a violinist who starts to play is just concentrated on violin and music of violin. You have to know all the great works of the composer, all the great interpreters of the, those great I mean, works. Is that a danger that, you know, if, you know, for example, if you're learning a, you know, one of the sort of seminal works of the, of the violin repertoire, you know, if you listen to, you know, 25 different violinists, is, it, is there a risk that you become a kind of magpie and you take this or that? Or do, does it require a strong personality to listen and then, as it were, push them back and say, no, this is my way. It really depends on the person. But I, I, since I was a kid, I listened to all the violin recordings. There is all of it. Now I do less. I mostly concentrate on uh, conductors and uh, singers and pianists. For some reason, I don't listen to the violin so much because I want to have my own perception because I, I kind of I but of course when I have something that like I'm in the mood to listen to some great violin recordings I would listen but uh, otherwise uh, mostly other genres of music so what what do the conductors teach you I mean who are the conductors you're you're attracted to there's many but uh, the one that really is like have inspired me of making the music alive and having their own sculpture in their interpretation. So of course, Furt Wengner to Carlos Kleiber to what we talked about, Galavanov, uh, which is not, uh, he's not known, sadly, and uh, he's been the influence of so many great musicians. He was Rachmaninoff's favorite conductor. And, uh, and also, I mean, if you listen to Galavanov conducting Rachmaninoff, it's almost like hearing Rachmaninoff conduct Rachmaninoff because exactly. you know, it's the same, it's the same kind of school and, and yeah. philosophy. And if you listen to his uh, uh, Wagner Tristan Isolde, uh, the prelude, 
and uh, but the orchestra version and Liebes daughter it's like you hear the music for the first time that's the thing that like you have heard this piece so many times but suddenly you listen to this how Calavano does it and it's like it's the first time you hear this piece the first time I heard it I was like what's going on I have to listen to it again and when I heard it again I understood this is what really is an interpretation that it's uh, it's so convincing of your idea it shouldn't be only as it's written because composers gave the score for us to also like experience a, a self you know for ourselves because there's so many opportunities in the music to really make it alive because if you just do it as it's written it's uh, it won't do anything of course the music is genius but you really have to have a special idea concept structure and then of course the meaning the truth in it and then maybe you can make it alive i mean the extraordinary thing about Furtwängler is you can listen to i don't know say the eroica symphony that he you know that they recorded you know like on a saturday a tuesday and the following friday and they'll all be completely different completely different and most of his recordings were live mm. so you can hear like the intensity it's not really perfect in the technical maybe aspects but in musical aspects it's above the this perfect Horvitz said perfect is imperfection <laughs> it's very true because when it becomes above this of course technique is inexcusable I believe especially for instrumentalists but sometimes the music can bring you to a different state Rachmaninoff when he talked about Anton Rubinstein so this was probably at that time was considered the greatest interpreter of music a pianist sadly we don't have recordings of him but he said that he was so perfectly technical and then one piece he played the Balkirev, uh, and he kind of uh, lost the text a bit, and then continued, and played afterwards just the great, the greatest music he ever heard. After he did these mistakes, but because the soul just was free, he just went with the flow, and he said even with those technical things, which he's already perfect, but even when there's something that happens, but the music is there, it's so much greater. And then, uh, then he said when he s later understood that he did a mistake, then he started playing more technically perfect, and the music was much less effective. The soul had gone. Yeah, when he was too careful. Now when he understood that he did a mistake, he started becoming careful. So this it's such a strange way in music that you really m have to make it so alive that something can be excusable. But of course it would be preferably a very technical also uh, perfection. I mean like Carlos Kleiber compared to Furtwängler and Carlos Kleiber they were so different because Furtwängler was so much for the main point of music that everything goes to that point and that it's so convincing and still he was doing so much difference in the uh, music scores like not always like what's written but he was always convinced as he said in his interview that that's how the composer would want and being this convinced and Carlos Kleiber was this perfectionist he had the most like so little recordings always canceling concert because he just didn't feel right and uh, always trying to achieve perfection in the sound and the everything is just perfect but at the same time making the music alive and uh, they both are great <laughs> they both are my favorites and uh, i mean do you find you know the fact that Furt Wengler could you know play the same work you know dozens of times and everyone would every time it would be different I mean here you are you know very relatively early in your career and there are you know there are a number of concertos that you know you will play for the next 50 years if not longer I mean is it the fact that you know every time you 
play a work with a different collaborator? It could be different. Is that what inspires you to kind of do it yet again? It's always different. I believe routine in music is the worst. So like you have an idea, you just, okay, I play this. Okay, next day, okay, I play this. Then go, go, go. This death for music. Every time it has to be like the f first time or I believe I play like it's the last time I do it. Because you never know. Like uh, it's better to do it as it's the last time. Mm. And uh, this music is too precious and too deep, too profound. It's immortal that you, you cannot just go out there and be like, okay, I'll just play it. Because it's not just something that you come and play on stage and leave for the next flight. There is, can be a person that uh, in the stage or something that are experiencing bad things or something or with themselves who are like maybe close to death, who can be this for the people who you really want to play for. And it always has to be everything you have because it can be the last moment. And this music is why it's so immortal because all these emotions of those composers have been tested by time. Because in Bach's time, there was many composers that were much better than him, more famous than him. And suddenly nobody remembers them, but everybody remembers Bach because he was the greatest and the quality, the mortality he achieved in his music and uh, that it connects to everybody. And I believe that this music will always be alive as all the immortal arts because for every person it's always interesting to find new things in life. And why people think, oh, it's only old people in the concert halls. Yes, because they've experienced most of their lives. And then they have come to something much more deeper and more profound. So these things are coming by age or you have it directly, you never know. That because if you first you listen to a recording or a piece of music and you're like ignored it. And later in life you have experienced much more things in life. Then you come back to it, you're like, wow, this really speaks to me. Then s later you want to see all the other symphonies. It's same with books. You read a uh, a uh, Dostoevsky book, you're like, wow, there's much more things in a book. Then you start reading other things that relate. Then you get deeper and deeper and deeper. Then this life, some people just uh, maybe uh, won't have the opportunity because they just are uh, happy with being just on earth Pff, normal. I don't know how to say, not really wanting to know more about ourselves, our souls. And this is what is culture. This is what really brings everybody together in a deeper meaning of life. I mean, you mentioned earlier, you talked about sort of the meaning in music. I mean, I, I'm, I'm reminded of a story that uh, somebody told me that when Leonard Bernstein used to rehearse with the New York Philharmonic, he'd suddenly, he'd sort of say, so, you know, do you want to know what this is about? And all the musicians say, oh yes, please tell us the tell a story. And he had a kind of narrative for a piece of music. I mean, when you play, you know, one of the great concertos, do you have in your mind you know, what you think it's about in a kind of, I mean, not a sort of, you know, actually quite a, a sort of nuts and bolts way, you know, this is, this is the story behind this concerto. It always has to be. It's always, first of all, there is always a point in music, in the piece that everything goes to. And uh, this is what Rachmaninoff was always trying to achieve after the concert when they came to him and told uh, uh, like, oh, it was such a great concert, or oh, incredible, he's like, no, no, no. I didn't get to the point the way I wanted. Just the point, this is the main thing, that everything has a structure, everything has a story, has a meaning behind it. It's not just some scores or like some uh, notes uh, through these notes, through the harmony, you can find everything. Because in harmony, you really can understand, oh wow, this is the character, what, what can this relate to? Then you'll read so much about the composer because it's really, I guess, almost like an actor, you're living into a role. 
and then uh, as the Stanislavski method that you have a goal then you live in to the goal and that's in music and you have to have the meaning you have to have the structure you have to have where everything is connecting to and knowing all these great music all these great interpreters to f find your way and uh, meaning the truth of this music like let's say in the Beethoven violin concerto it's very written very simply like the violin part is uh, mostly scales actually in the first moment it's very simple in writing but when you bring all these qualities of the whole score of the whole harmony of what he means and you relate to all the other music he did you understand this is not just some music it's something that connects you to something else that he's something when he's writing something really emotion or like uh, very strong then you understand it has to be very strong and that it flows in this way the suddenly it's the most sensitive most pianissimo in the second movement there is this place where the violin has just one line and played the most sensitive part and the orchestra part has like this pianissimo and to find this like perfect sensitivity and then you understand when you think about it that it's not music from here he's trying to reach something else like all the great artists and uh, the trills of his last sonata from Beethoven you understand this is not just some trills if you just look at the scores okay I play the trill if you s relate to all the music relate to what he felt at that time and in the harmony you understand these trills are something from otherworldly at the end of the 32nd sonata so this is how you experience and also I believe everything I try to see in the composer I need to see in life first I try of course because otherwise it won't be really yours because and when you're playing one of these works do you think you, you know you're, you're conveying this incredible beauty from the composer to the audience. I mean, do you think that process is a kind of healing process or, or a sort of transformative process in the audience? Are you, you know, what are you trying to do in that moment that you're playing this exquisite slow movement of the Beethoven concerto? I mean, I, I, uh, it really depends on the music, but for me, it's mostly just to be as alive as possible in that moment and to bring the music alive as I, I believe the composer wanted like if he was on stage he would be like yes this maybe it would, wasn't even his idea but he would be convinced that okay this is what I would love and what I try to achieve and uh, on stage it is performing not just the music it's educating and also you never know who, who is the audience as I told before you don't just play for the people you play for the people who really appreciate who have some things in their life that they can really relate or or last days you never know or it's my, my last day and there's also that wonderful possibility, well, more, probably more than a possibility, that there are people in that concert hall who have never heard that piece before. Exactly. Exactly. Maybe for somebody, I believe, is you're super young or and go to concerts, you won't understand. But you will be introduced to it and you will start getting to it later. And, uh, and then some people who have listened for the first time, who have so much experience in life, suddenly just starts understanding what this immortal art is that why this music is different from others I don't believe it's like a music of uh, different uh, categories the like classical jazz and all this it's music that transcends time and been tested by time these things is possible to bring for any people and at any time 
that they can feel this. And uh, this is so important because this brings everybody together. And are your musical tastes very broad? Do you listen to yes, music? Yes, I listen to jazz, I listen to uh, just, uh, all, all great music, even rock, uh, some, which is great, which is, uh, has a special personality, has a soul in it. I, I adore. And uh, interpretation is bringing these scores alive. And it's like a sculpture. You have a concept, an immortal idea, and you try to uh, sculpt it to make this thing alive, but in the moment. And uh, yeah, I, ju I just try to find as much music experiences and uh, culture in general. And you need to really bring this to people as much as possible. And uh, that it's not that you just categorized, that it really is for everybody who's willing to feel something more profound. Now, I mean, sort of, you know, for a violinist who's, you know, you, you decided on your, your you, this is going to be your profession. I assume that there's a kind of, there's like sort of maybe five concertos you sort of have to get to grips with immediately. So, you know, probably Beethoven, Mendelssohn, Brahms, Tchaikovsky, Bruch. That's probably the kind of, the sort of the famous five. And then you might, you, know, you can then bolt maybe the Sibelius on. But I mean, is that fair that you've sort of, I mean, you've sort of got to master those initially. I mean, you've got yeah. kind of, got, it's a bit like a French chef. You've got to have a particular number of sources you can make without having to think about it. Yes, like uh, the Bach, Sonatas Partitas, Scales. Uh, all these, but also you not just master them, uh, like you never master these no. works, uh, but you can get to know them, that you have more time and experience that it all gets, like evolves together. This is important. And uh, I don't believe in uh, there's a specific age when you have to take a specific piece, because I believe you either have it or you don't. Because I've seen some uh, great young musicians who perform much more deep than some old musicians. But it's, uh, it's about the musician. It's about the life you have lived. And uh, even if you take it very young, of course, you won't, it won't be your last idea of the piece. This, <laughs> this must be a something of experience of a lifetime because this music, you can always find new things. And uh, I believe if you have the will and have the soul to understand this, then you can, I feel, maybe become better and better and experience new things. Mm. And I, I played, the, let's say, the Beethoven violin concerto since I was 13. So I played it all these years. I mean, was there occasion, sort of, was there a time sort of along your relationship with the Beethoven when you suddenly, you gave a performance, you just think, actually, I've kind of, I've, I've gone up a step, you know, I've, I've, something about that work has spoken to me in a way that it's never spoken to me before. That's when I recorded it with my latest album at the anniversary of Beethoven, the 250th anniversary with Valery Gergiev and uh, Munich Philharmonic. And... Uh, that's when the moment I, f I was, it was always my dream to record because uh, it was my favorite concerto, the Beethoven, because it has everything. It has the simplest, the structure, connection to the worldly, the most uh, divine moments that you can, like when you play there, you feel like you're really, well, you're not, you're nothing compared to this music. You're really like, it's so otherworldly and you understand that we are, compared to the whole universe and everything that's uh, that we're really nothing that and I really felt that maybe I had something to say at that moment when I recorded it and uh, I'm happy with it but still I'm finding new things it's not like okay I found a specific way I feel comfortable this the way I kind of want so I'm gonna s be stuck here then, uh, then uh, like it's only a way down, and I'm still finding new things in th these pieces. 
I mean, that must be the wonderful thing about concerto work, is that because it's con collaborative, yeah, it's not just you. You know, the conductor exactly. might bring something, the orchestra might bring something. Exactly, you you learn new things with the uh, orchestras and conductors you pl uh, perform with, and with the experience you have, also not just having the work with you, but also on stage. Of how it does feel with public, because with public. It is that atmosphere you need for music, I believe, for me. Like, I need this feeling of people. And I think a lot of musicians, you know, during the pandemic, actually realised that what they were missing more than anything were the yeah. people sitting out there kind of giving this energy back to them. Yeah, because then you can really experience and give what you want with the music. And this, they have this atmosphere like it's a magical atmosphere. Like for some reason, the timings, the feelings, you feel much more alive when there's public. Like you can play through a piece at home alone and be like, okay, I'm ready. And then on stage, it's a completely different feeling because you, you, this is a different experience. Because suddenly you can find that there's a time, diff control of time, which I believe is the most important in music that here with this stage, with this audience, with this feeling of this moment, I can do this time differently. And it's, and that what dictates time, I believe it's this depth of the soul. It's not what you can learn because time is like timing in music. It's not something that, okay, one second, and now you play. <laughs> and then, but there's also that, that, there's also that kind of, that musical strange time thing where yeah. you can listen to a piece of music and you think, gosh, that's fast. And actually it's not fast at all, or gosh, that's slow. And there's something about what's going on that makes it sound fast or sound slow. Yeah, I, I like the timing of not the whole piece, I meant like the mm. notes or the flow of a phrase. That, that is what the soul dictates, what you cannot learn. Why is Horowitz, why is Carlos Kleiber, why is uh, Furt Wengler uh, have this no feeling of time in the music and still flowing, but nobody can copy it because you have the time of the music, but you have the opportunity to control the time, not changing the rhythm, but having your feeling of time. And this is all the soul. Uh, what what kind of soul it would dictates the time. And this is what with the audience, it is special because it always changes. And it's always a different feeling from when you just play the through the piece alone. It's very important with audience. And this is what we do for. We do it to, to like, feed souls. I don't know, like uh, what's Rachman, uh, of what Bach said, that uh, the main aim of music is cleansing of the soul and glory of God. Mm. And uh, you need people for this. And Beethoven said that the music should go from the heart to the heart. So it's a, a, communi a communication. Yeah. Without a person or people. I, I For me, it doesn't matter. It's, 5,000 people or two, one people, one person. If there's a soul that you can connect with. That's so how did, you, how did you spend your pandemic? Because you know, when you were not allowed to perform and you, you lost these souls to connect with, did you use the time to, to learn new repertoire or fine tune repertoire? I mean, what, what did you do during that sort of strange kind of year, year and a half, two years? Um, so first it was very strange, of course, because you were confused. You were thinking like, is public gonna come back? Because this is what we do for everything for, you know? And uh, when is the concerts gonna start? I everything was very strange. I didn't, I couldn't touch my instrument because I, it was just so s heavy. But then I came back and I understood that I can like it's impossible not to play. And then I started learning new repertoire. I had more free time. It was to read, to uh, to uh, 
be with some of my friends more, which I didn't have the time to socialize so much. And uh, being more with the scores and the instrument without performing is also very special. It's good to have this break. And uh, learning new repertoire, which I was thinking like, when can I learn this? When uh, there's so much things going on, it's but now having the opportunity to learn these things was great. And how do you plan your your sort of, you know, how do you sort of build your repertoire? Because, you know, we, we've sort of alluded to these five concertos, which I assume, you know, part of your repertoire as they are of every other violinist. But how, how often do you add a new concerto? You know, do you set yourself a target of, you know, I'm going to do two more this year, plus, you know, one or two of the, the old favourites? Or, yeah. you know, how do you, how do you plan it? Uh, it's really of how I feel, what I want to learn, and uh, of planning of the concerts. If uh, I see at that moment I want to play this concerto, I have the opportunity to try it, then I, I learn it. And there's much more things I want to learn, many more concertos I want to experience, and still a lot more to dig deeper in the concertos I know. So it's, it's really just what I feel when is the timing uh, good mm -hmm. for me to learn a new uh, concerto or piece. Which And I only perform things that I feel connected. Nothing that's like, uh, doesn't speak to me. So where does that generally take you in, in terms of repertoire, I mean, does it take you towards the kind of Russian repertoire? I mean, Shostakovich, Prokofiev. Or yes, I, I love them, <laughs> and I love Mozart, Beethoven, Bach. And uh, I mean, like, I love most of the music. It's just I perform the ones that I can relate to. Mm -hmm. What about new music? I mean, is that something that features in your? Yes, yes. Uh, I really. Uh, look forward to learn the Vasque's violin concerto called Distant Light. This has really something to say and it's uh, contemporary music. And uh, th there's some composers that are great that, uh, that I don't feel connected to. I know they are great music, but I don't feel connected to. Uh, but I'm still so open for contemporary music because when I find something, I'm more than happy to start learning. And are you a fast learner? Uh, it depends on the piece. <laughs> uh, I can, if I need to learn quickly, I will. Mm -hmm. If I don't, I will take my time. And what about recording? I mean, you've, you've, you've made, what, three recordings now. Is, that, is, is recording something? Because you're, you're obviously very interested in recording as a, you know, as a, a sort of, you know, getting to grips with the past and the great players. I mean, is it something you've enjoyed doing yourself? Uh, recordings, it's a mark of what I felt at, at that time and what the perfect way I wanted to feel at that time. And uh, this is very important because this is what you want to say in a different level of performing on stage and uh, I try to mix and uh, do live recordings now what I did with the Beethoven because I understood the timing is so important with public that it's a diff diff completely different feeling and there's this aliveness so that's why I want to do the Beethoven live and the Tchaikovsky concerto as well but uh, recordings is uh, what marks a time of what you felt mm in that moment and uh, it's I'm so honored to have the opportunity to record with these great colleagues musicians well, tell us a bit about the Tchaikovsky concerto because you, you you've had an interesting relationship with that and the and the sort of c connection to a tradition back through Spivakov and and that, that sort of Russian school yeah I mean Tchaikovsky is uh, is, is a Russian soul but he had a lot of French influence and uh, he was living in Switzerland and uh, he had his own feeling, a very, a very melancholic person that 
couldn't really open himself up because of his uh, life of living on in secret mm -hmm. and true music was his way to open himself really and uh, you can hear that especially in his last works and everything in his influence uh, you can in Tchaikovsky you can hear theater ballet opera the folk lyric feelings of Russian culture and uh, the immortal melodies he creates and still there is always this sadness even in the happy moments there's always this uh, uncomfortable feeling but in his music it really you can feel he's really opening himself up and then at the end of his life of course with the sixth symphony you really understand it he's connecting to a different sphere and that he was always having this feeling of uh, death around him especially with his mother died uh, when he was young his sister as well so it was always this feeling do you listen to his operas because I, I mean i always think that that on eugene onegin is an incredible sort of key to so oh. much of onegin that's what he was about Pick queen, Dam, of spades, yes. Qu queen of Sp spades uh, i believe his best works are Pick them and uh, how do you say it in English? Queen of Spades. Queen of yeah. Spades. And uh, Tchaikovsky uh, Symphony Number no. Six. It's just uh, something else. And uh, in the violin concert is why I recorded it because it's the main, really Russian composer, and the main violin concerto f for romantic, I believe, that uh, every violinist knows and needs to be introduced to and uh, why I recorded with Maestro Spivakov because he was the first conductor I performed with and he was the first uh, violinist that really inspired me with Heifetz. I saw him in a Russian TV and him playing when he was young uh, a Tchaikovsky concerto. I was like wow such sound, such beautiful playing, so effortless, and uh, such a Russian soul in his playing, in especially in this Tchaikovsky violin concerto, which I heard. So it was like, for me, the best recording of that concerto. And I wanted to record with him uh, the, the concerto. And we recorded it at the same place where we performed for the first time. So it was a very personal feeling and the music making was very personal. And is it, does the, does the, when you perform the Tchaikovsky concerto with either a Russian orchestra or a Russian conductor, is it different to, to say a Westerner, I don't know, an American it's, or a I, British conductor? I wouldn't say it's the conductor, I would say it's the culture mm -hmm. is different. Like I've performed with some Russian conductors that didn't understand anything, like, and then some who are just like, connected so deeply with this music. It's all about the culture you have in yourself mm -hmm. and the knowledge. And then I have some non-Russian conductors who performed Tchaikovsky incredibly, uh, like Furtwängler, the Tchaikovsky number no. six. Like I was thinking maybe Gergiev recording he did with Tchaikovsky six, every time he was on stage, wow, the best. Then uh, Mravinsky, I listen, oh my God. And then of course, and Pletnyov as conductor. Pletnyov as a conductor. You're like, but then there's only Russians. So I'm like thinking like, wait, is it only <laughs> Russians I'm like inspired for as interpreters of Tchaikovsky? And of course, Pletnyov on the piano playing the Tchaikovsky's, I don't know anybody better for me. There's no better, but like what I feel connected to, you yeah, know? Yeah. And, uh, but then Furtwängler, you listen to his Tchaikovsky six, it's so convincing, it's so soulful, it's really Tchaikovsky, but he was the most German uh, mm. kind of uh, way of uh, life. 
But I guess what he lived through, what you know, he the times through. he lived exactly. must. And that's the point. It's all about the life you have lived and the strength of your, and the deepness of your soul. So it doesn't matter where, where you're from, that the composers, if they're Russian, you have to be Russian. And if you're, yeah, if you're Beethoven, German, you have to be German. Like, these things is all about the life you've lived. And because this music connects all cultures, it's not just one, it's immortal. It's for everybody. So if you have the depth, the knowledge, and like you see with Fort Wenger, this is the point. Now you're, you know, the, the world, the musical world has kind of, you know, we're a little way back to how it was before. I mean, do you think, do you think audiences have changed in their response to music? I mean, I've, you know, I've started obviously going back to concerts and I just kind of feel a, almost a new kind of receptiveness to music, you know, uh, you know, music perhaps one would have taken for granted. All of a sudden it's got a kind of value and a preciousness that, you know, we may have just kind of, oh, you know, another concert, but actually now it's, wow, here's a concert and here's music and I'm going to connect and I'm going to hear stuff that speaks down the years. I mean, do, do, from the stage, do you feel that? At the beginning, I felt a huge appreciation, a different sense of quality of listening. Suddenly people were not coughing as much and uh, it was very, very quiet. And uh, still for people to go to this concert was a risk because it still wasn't over and still it was full halls because people really need this. They need this experience. They need music in real life to get to feel this because it's all the cultures, we cannot live without culture, then we forget what we are, like why we are humans and not robots on phones and uh, computers, that everything becomes materialistic. And uh, people will have that always, because we still have a soul, it will always dictate us. Even if the whole material world is around us, it will still take us out of it. And does that give you a new? Does that give you a different sense of responsibility now? In a way, you're giving something that people, you know, really need and are prepared, as you say, to sort of risk their health almost to come and hear. Uh, I always had a feeling of uh, uh, that it's not just a concert; it's a special, uh, special place to be, and for the public, it's always for me a very special thing. It's not that suddenly now I appreciate them more because they're like risking it. It's always, always because you never know who is in the audience. And, uh, but I admire that the people, are, I can see that they want to do this. They want to. So it's like a more of a proof of why we are doing this, that this, it's all good. <laughs> that it won't die ever, even in the worst state of, like, of the world in this time. I mean, do you enjoy the life of a sort of, you know, a traveling musician, you know, you fly in, you know, you rehearse, you perform, you may do two or three concerts with the same orchestra and conductor. And then, I mean, do you find it, is it a, is it a social life or do you find there are sort of moments of kind of loneliness that when you've given your soul and then it just sort of evaporates? Yes, there is, of course, but I admire those moments because this when you have this very special solitude, not that you're, you're alone, but you're like given everything, everything you have to say, everything you have kept for the whole day prepared for this moment in the evening. And then suddenly it's like, it's over. And it, if, if it was a bad concert, then it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> You're glad it's over. <laughs> no, that I'm really like, cannot s like eat or sleep. Like I was, it's really like not good. But then uh, I never really think it was like a great, good concert. I just feel like if I really lived the moment, I felt alive at the moment, then I'm, then I'm happy. Mm. And uh, aloneness is very important as an artist because this where you, learn this was your experience because 
you really need to know so much about yourself through the inside and all this uh, noises from the outside is not really so much needed so I, I'm comfortable of traveling and the rehearsal it makes me happy of course it can be tiring but it's so m worth it and uh, if you don't love what you do it's not what you should do so what's what's on this sort of music on horizon for you have you got concertos you're taking into your repertoire that you're kind of you know getting up to performing standard as it were yes so Shostakovich number one it's a big aim I always wanted to play of this tragic feeling of the suffering at that time that the third moment he wrote Requiem for his friends that he was always scared of death, always having death around him that he could be taken away and everybody around him is being taken away and always being like a hostage situation. This is the perfect representation in this music. The last movement is r kind of a rhythm and like it's like a celebration but it's not a celebration, it's like a forced celebration. It's like the whole like you have to celebrate. And this is this music really brings this spirit. So it's so so inspiring. I'm really looking forward to do this and as he's for me uh one of the greatest composers of all times, of course, Beethoven of twentieth century. And uh then the Schumann violin concerto, which is so underrated, sadly rarely performed because it's really, I believe, one of the greatest concertos ever. Because when there is a person with such knowledge, purity, when you s read his essays, when you read them, even his advice for young musicians, is just the most perfect person, most intellectual, and emotionally intellectual. And still he went crazy. Went to asylum and he wrote this concerto while being in the asylum. And this, really sh this music really shows that he still has this purity and s have this craziness around which makes it so incredibly divine incredibly crazy and pure at the same time that's what makes it so special and even like you looked at the manuscript how he wrote the scores something he just forgot to write because the spirit was probably so strong that he was seeing above as he was saying he was hearing the angel the melodies of this concerto he was hearing uh the angels of mendelssohn schubert i remember yeah mendelssohn schubert dictating him what to write so can you imagine the state of this but you've talked, you know, you've talked about some of the mentors, you know, who've been very important to you in your career. I mean, now, do you, are you sort of getting together a group of maybe younger conductors, people you, as it were, can grow up musically with and, you know, imagine a, you know, a, a musical relationship now for the next few decades? I mean, are there people who have sort of entered your life and you think, actually, yes, we can make music together and we can explore these works into the future? Yes, for sure. I mean, I've performed with Klaus Mekele, a Finnish conductor, who is uh, very young. We are almost the same age. He's, of course, older. But uh, compared to all these old masters, he has this feeling, he has this old soul. I feel like he was having this feeling of being a conductor before uh, past life. We've been performing since we were 16 together. And we have been experiencing different concertos. So there is a special collaboration and friendship as well. And that uh, we can really experience music together and uh, talk recordings. I was going to say, like you, he's got a, you know, obviously a deep passion for the, for the recorded catalogue. Yeah, yeah. That's why we can connect so well. And uh, with music, it's the connection is in music on stage. It's not mostly with words. It's mostly about the feeling of the spirits, you know. This, uh, this you cannot explain. 
this is what I feel that we can experience this. There's not so many more young musicians that have been able to really experience a lot of things because most of my life I've been with older musicians who I've learned from. Because I'm still very young, so like it's very difficult to find uh, somebody that that I can connect, especially with conductors, because it's really not a age for conductors. It's very is a really rare case to be so young and be so accomplished musically. And uh, but there is many great pianists that I admire working with who are young. Like recently, I performed with Alexander Kantarov recital and uh, I love playing with him and we have great friendship as well and uh, on stage the feeling and uh, the ideas we have the way of life is very relatable so it's great and we can learn from each other and uh, but of course it's very rare it's like really rare when somebody's so young you can learn from each other. And how do you, I mean, how do you like, if that's quite the right word, you know, the sort of expectations on a musician in this age, you know, with social media, you know, giving interviews like we're doing, you know, I mean, it's a kind of game you've got to play. I mean, is it something you, you know, I mean, things like tweeting, I mean, do, do you go down that particular route? Do you engage with the public or? I try to be as uh, less in this social media because I, I don't understand this like you make pictures all the time like or you're performing or like always uh, happy like uh, uh, showing what you do uh, showing what you eat or something I, I, I don't I'm, I'm, I have nothing against it I don't feel that's me but I don't go to extremes like uh, the Chinese philosophy of what Carlos Kleiber had, like to not leave any trace of your life except the work you have. I would love to do that, but today it's impossible. <laughs> but I keep, of course, my private life. I would never post what I do privately on social media. What do I see most of my colleagues do? What they uh, do on their life things. I just don't feel comfortable I, to share these things. It's my life. And there's also this weird, you know, this weird thing about, oh, yes, we're friends. You're thinking, well, no, we're not friends. Yeah, yeah. But it's uh, many people, all these labels, my agents say it's important for younger generations. So I keep a bit information where I will perform maybe or what I just did that's related to what I do, to my craft, to my music, what I feel maybe would be interesting. I would never post like every day, like my rehearsal, what I do in practice, this all in my uh, space. And this is always going to be private. And after all, what you're about, I mean, is yeah. communicating through music, not through exactly. words and pictures. Exactly. This is the point. And uh, this, the whole point of music. And this social media mostly is what are these numbers? Okay, you, you communicate. But then, like, some are f so famous, but I have nothing to say in music. I mean, who are musicians? But, and uh, so th it really doesn't matter. Maybe it matters for young people, but most of the public don't come really for because of social media, I think. They come to really feel something. It's one of, I mean, one of the lovely things about Verbier, which, you know, wh where we are, is that, you know, yes, we have an audience here, people come to the concerts, they're incredibly enthusiastic, but actually, you know, on Medici, you know, you, you can actually go out and reach hundreds of thousands of people outside, which is, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful glimpse into this very, a very special atmosphere here. Yeah, yeah. I believe these videos and recordings of a specific moment in the perfect time you want of a for a musician, this is very great because to distribute this message of this great music and the great artists, and uh, this is very important. But social media is promoting yourself has always been a problem for me because I I cannot really think about like promoting myself so much when this music is so much <laughs> more like we are like nothing compared to this. So like. 
that's the thing I don't believe in this promoting yourself social media t Twitter I do it I has something but I don't post so much I just like if you need to post something like a concert to have a project or what you just did for a project well Daniel thank you so much for sharing your time and thoughts with us and we'll let you get back to Verbier and get back to what you clearly loving love doing more than anything else and that's making music thank you very much it was so lovely to speak to you do you use other objects to make music aside from your own instrument you can't really think <laughs> exactly if I do have any other objects except uh, my violin are you more comfortable surrounded by noise or silence I'm more comfortable surrounded by silence if you could choose the sound of your doorbell what would it be I mean what's your ringtone something very simple because it should be very simple and that you can hear it what is the sound you wake up to I wake up to the sound of the alarm which is a very strong alarm because for me it's very difficult to wake up. <laughs> what to you is the most relaxing sound or the most irritating? The sound of beautiful melancholic music, like something, some special jazz can be great after a long hard day of work. And the most irritating sound is just the sounds you don't want to hear at that specific moment. <laughs> what sound reminds you most of home? Probably the sound of the voices of my family. Probably this was, of course, always is in my head of home. What's the first sound you remember hearing? <laughs> That's a very difficult question. I don't remember my first sound I heard. I remember the first piece I heard for music, which inspired me the most directly, which was the Bach Violin Concerto. What sound Im makes you think immediately of a happy memory or a happy place? and the sound of being uh, with the family, with the voices, but also when you haven't performed with an orchestra in a long time, and they start tuning and you come there and you're like, I miss this sound, just them tuning. What is for you the most musical sound not made by an instrument? It could be uh, the, the wind when you're in the forest and this feeling is really feels very musical and uh, being at in the mountains in some small river is moving the water is such a great sound and then there's birds all nature sounds are I believe great and to be around nature is, I feel, is so important as a musician. Because you can really feel this feeling of being a part of the world. <laughs> <laughs>